Well, it's great to be with you here today and uh, last night, and it's exciting to be able to preach the Word of God to you today. I know that uh, you're missing Pastor Eric. I know he was with you last Sunday, and and uh, that infection hit his body again. So keep, let's just take a moment and pray for him today. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're a God of being a way maker. That's who you are. And Lord, I pray that you'd make a way to bring healing completely to Pastor Eric Brookins. Lord, I just thank you for his heart, for his love for his people, for his love for you, his love for his family. And Lord, I just pray that, Lord, that you would just work a mighty work in his life, that you would take away that infection, that you'd heal him, dear God, that he could be totally restored, be back in the full time of this ministry that he so much loves with this wonderful church at Surfside. I pray that you use the message today to be an encouraging message to everyone that's here present or those that are listening online. Thank you for your grace. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about joy and discovering the joyful life. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of people I've noticed that don't have a lot of joy in their life. My wife and I have done some uh, part-time work as an Instacart shopper. If you know what that is, you go out and you shop for food and you bring it to people and drop it at their doorstep. And, uh, and one of the things I've noticed is that I, when we were in the grocery stores, that's something I never ever went into until I retired was a grocery store. My wife always took care of that, so it was kind of a new whole world for me. But uh, what I noticed that everyone, that most everyone I encountered had no joy, had a scowl on their face, was looking downward, where it looked like they were the most happy, unhappiest people in all the world. You know why I believe that? Because they don't know Jesus. They don't have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, as we talk about joy today, I, a few weeks ago when I was with you, uh, I, I gave you a message on faithfulness. I talked about how you can have that faithfulness in your life, and that's really, again, one of the fruit of the Spirit, and joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. John Stott prayed this prayer each day. He said, Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I want to share with you out of this message, and as we look at the fruit of the spirit of joy, that that word joy is not just a word. It is that which God desires for each of us. 200 times in our Bible, that word is translated joy. Paul used it 21 times in the book of Philippians. We see it uh, in today's text. is often referred to as the epistle of joy. So you'll find the promise and the real experience of joy scattered all throughout Scripture, through all the pages of Scripture. So what he was saying here is that God wants his people to live joy-filled lives. And when they do, they walk in his ways. Joy is a promise that we all can claim and it's an expectation that we all can have. Our lives can be and should be defined by joy, but we have to be willing to do what joy requires. So before we can experience it, we have to define it. So what is joy? Is it a synonym for happiness? Is it a synonym for giddiness? Is it a synonym for feeling bubbly around the clock? Well, you know, some of you are kind of like that. My wife's kind of a happy person in the morning. I'm not. I mean, I, you know, after one cup of coffee, I can get out a few words, you know. After two cups of coffee, I can carry on conversations. But I'm not a morning person, never have been, probably never will be. But I'll, I'll confess with you that she's a, she's a bubbly person. My mother, God bless her. You know, five foot one mother I had, you know, I'm over six foot one, okay, I stood over, but she was the most bubbliest person I ever knew. But I, I have to understand that there's a difference, though, of being just bubbly and having true joy. You know, and sometimes I've used the word joy and happiness interchangeably, but they're not really the one and the same. So today I would say that joy is that promise to each believer goes a little deeper than mere happiness. If you remember as a believer, that word is possess all of the fruit of the Spirit. All of them, not just joy, not just faithfulness, but we're going to have peace and gentleness and long-suffering, and all of these should be in our life. And that's, that's a really important aspect of the life of a believer because that identifies us with the power of the Holy Spirit working in our life. So let's define joy. I looked it up in the dictionary. 
Webster defined it, joy the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one, one desires. Now, with all due respect to Mr. Webster, I would say close but not quite. Christian joy is defined differently. John Piper described it this way. He said, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. Now, it's interesting here that Piper emphasizes that joy is a feeling. He would say, he'd be the first to say, of course, that we don't live by our feelings. We live by faith. And I'm glad about that, aren't you? There are some days I don't feel like I'm all that much of a Christian. I don't feel all that much that I'm saved. I don't feel like God is even listening to me. I feel like he's way, way out of the way, out of my life. And I think I'm sure that all of you have felt like that way at times. But I'm, I'm so glad to know that he never leaves me. He never leaves you. He's always there for you. He never leaves you. He said, nevertheless, I will never leave you. You know, so we are walking in this in step with the Holy Spirit, we didn't expect to experience the emotion of joy on a regular basis. Now, joy is a good feeling that in the soul that is not at all dependent on our circumstances, but is dependent upon the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. So if you're filled with the Spirit of God, one of the natural occurrences will come out of your life will be joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. You can't manufacture joy. Have you ever tried to manufacture a smile? You know, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. You know, that's the Christianese way of you know talking to people at church sometimes. How, how's your, how's it going today? I'm doing great. You know, and you're not. And uh, and sometimes people would ask me, well, uh, how, how, how are you doing? And, and I would begin to tell them, well, I had this problem and this problem. And the car broke down and I didn't feel very good. No, they don't want to know that. Just say, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Move onward. You know. And that's the way that most people act, even in the church family. Even though we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we forget to know that we are to be authentic and we're to be genuine with one another. Now, you may not have time to go into great detail, but so you say, ask me about it later. Let's get together. And maybe you can pray for me. You know, so it's important that we know that we can be authentic with one another in the body of Christ. So manufacturing joy, you can't do it. It's a gift from God. And we must do what we must do to work in cultivating that spirit's work in our life. So I'm going to look at three ways you can, con you can cultivate the quality of the Holy Spirit inspired joy in your daily walk. And before we do that, let's take a moment and we're going to read our text for this message this morning. It's found in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Did you hear what he called them? My joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia, and I, prayed with, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. I love this one. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say what? Rejoice. Let your, all your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Did you get that? Do not be anxious. In other words, don't worry about everything. Don't worry about anything, he says. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of such things. So right in that text, he tells us how to have joy. Not to think about all the negative things that are going on in the world and in our life, but think about those things that are praiseworthy. And we'll go get to that in a moment. Now, if you know me, and you don't, but if you knew me really well, you knew that I am not a very good gardener. You've got some gardeners here. How many of you like to garden? Like to work in your yard? God bless you. I don't understand it. Uh, but, you know, I, I know that gives some of you some really peace and joy and happiness, you know. But uh, for me, getting out and digging in the dirt, you know, just doesn't do it for me. And I'm not very good at it. I tried to do a garden about a year ago, and oh, my goodness, it looked good for a while. Then it all, everything kind of went downhill from there. But, uh, but I, I learned that I can keep my palm trees alive. I have eight palm trees in my yard. 
and I can keep the grass green by fertilizing it three times a, uh, you know, three times a year and, and by uh, putting the sprinklers on it. Uh, I've learned that much, and I can do a pretty good job, but I wanted to do a job when my father-in-law was going into an assisted living. I, 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 he moved, I moved him out of the house, and he, and he had some rose bushes he'd bought. And so I found one that was still looking like it was going to live, and I took it home, and I put it in a pot. And you see it there. And, uh, and one of the things that I was able to do is to get it to bloom. I fertilized it, and what I learned that I had to do something to make it bloom like that is I had to prune it. So every time it would bloom, I had to get out and take the pruning shears and I had to trim it around, take all the other dead br uh, blooms off of it and some of the other dead stuff. And, and, then, and just in a few weeks, it would do the same thing again. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. So I learned that much about it. And then uh, so, but I want you to know that pruning is the first step to experiencing joy. And I'm not talking literally here about getting and, you know, chopping anything. But what we're talking about here is that we need to eliminate the joy killers. We have to eliminate the joy killers. I'm talking about those things which sabotage the joy that God wants us to have. And there are many out there. And today I'll quickly point out a few of them. The first joy killer to watch out for is the habit of complaining. Now let me ask you a question. Have you complained any this week? You don't have to raise your hand. You know you have. You may have complained on the way to church this morning. You may have complained that someone didn't get up early enough. And, you know, or you made your rush or or the coffee wasn't good, or, or, or some, somebody in front of you was an idiot, you know, that, that, that you were driving and they ran out in front of you, you know, whatever it is that we complain. And, and a close companion to complaining is criticism. It's hard to engage with one without the other, and both tend to be equally counterproductive. And this is why Paul said, do everything without complaining or arguing. Now, that's a good verse to memorize. Let's say it together. Do everything without complaining or arguing. So anytime someone starts complaining in your household or you start complaining, remember that verse, quote it out loud because that's what the Bible tells us that we need to be doing, doing, doing everything without complaining and without arguing. And, and, and it wouldn't be great if we could learn to do that in our churches. I've been in some churches, let me tell you, they didn't love one another. I can tell whether churches love one another, whether or not whether they're hanging out with one another. And I can tell you guys love each other because y'all didn't get in here till like, you know, uh, the last minute. Why? Because you're out talking and fellowshipping with one another. I preached at a church last week, uh, not too far from here, First Baptist Church of Arantia. And, and I, I was always come at least a half hour early. And we sat down in the back row. My wife and I were sitting there and we're just watching people. And I noticed that everybody was talking, and, and, and soon the screen came on, and the countdown came on, and you're still talking, and yabbering. And the music started, they were still talking, and yabbering. I said, you know what? That's
I remember we, I had planned the restaurant, and it, we, we were going to have a great evening. I was looking forward to it. Well, my dad calls me up, and that was before cell phones. I'd gotten home from work, and he calls me up, and he said, uh, Ralph, I, I'm having a problem with my truck. There's water leaking out from it. Would you come on over and look at it? So I, I'm a pretty good mechanic back then because I could work on his cars back then. And so I went over his, tru his truck and realized it was his water pump. And so I said, Dad, I'll, 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 get, I'll get it fixed. So I took it off really quick and, and uh, took the fan belts off and, you know, the, drained the radiator and the whole thing. And, and I ran down to the, to the auto store, which is about a mile and a half away, and got a, another part and for another water pump, brought it back on, put it all back together, put the radiator back together, you know, and everything I had to do, put the antifreeze in and started it up and it started dripping. I said, oh, man. Looked at my watch and, and I said, I got to got to head on back to the store. So I took it back off and did the whole nine yards, came back and got another one, came back and put it on and got it all ready. I started it back up. And guess what? It was dripping. So I said, man, by that time, I should have been home showered and ready to go out to out to eat for my anniversary. And uh, but I knew that my dad needed the truck the next day to go to work. And so I better hurry up and you know do something. So I went back to get the third one, brought back and did the whole nine yards, put it on. And that time it was okay, but by that time my joy had disappeared. I can't tell you that it wasn't the best evening. I mean, we're at the fancy restaurant, you know, you can tell how fancy they are because the darker are in there. And, and, and no, no lie, it, it, was, it was so dark that the lady, the, the, the server gave me a flashlight to look at the menu. I don't know if they were trying to disguise the roaches running around or what. I have no idea. But what I was saying is that, uh, that uh, you know, I remember that it took a long time for me to rekindle some joy in my life. So it, it's amazing. It was really insignificant. I mean, it, it was an hour. I was an hour late. But, you know, I want you to know that sometimes we let insignificant things ruin our joy. Now, that's a personal example, and it's pretty petty if you think about it. But the fact is that, that some of us struggle with bitterness over things that have happened in our lives and in our relationships many, many years ago. And I can always tell when someone's struggling with that because when they're having an, an issue, and I have done a lot of marital counseling in my ministry, and, and uh, when, I, when, the, when the wife would say, well, I remember back 10 years ago when you, oh, my goodness. You haven't been putting clean clothes in the closet, have you? You haven't been trying to move all that other garbage to the side and get rid of the bitterness in your relationship. And that's what we have to do. We have to put new things in our relationship, you know? And, and so when you allow some offense in the past, when you allow some heartbreak in the past to, to control you and to continue to guide your thoughts and minds and you hold on to that bitterness, you know, you surrender your joy. So if there's something that is in the past that needs to be resolved and can be resolved, resolve it. Don't wait. If forgiveness needs to be extended, extend forgiveness. Otherwise, let it go. Bitterness is never worth the price you pay to indulge it. Don't let the past live rent-free in your head. That's why Paul said, listen, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. You know how important it is to be compassionate with people, compassionate with your children, your grandchildren, compassionate with your friends, and you know, they're gonna let you down. You know, they're, they're gonna bother you at times. They're not gonna reciprocate an invitation. But, you know, you're to forgive them as God forgave you. So every time you think you've got something that's bothering you and you have a holding on to something, remember what Jesus has done for you. Remember the cross. Remember what he said from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So if he can forgive us, we're to forgive others. Third joy killer to watch out for is the daily issues and problems that are part of your life. Now, we all will have them. You'll have one possibly today, a problem. You know, it may be something little or big you may get home today god forbid and your air conditioner is not working you know it, it may happen you know i came home the other day and uh we, we got a little condo that we rent and up in daytona we have and and i came back and the air conditioner was broken 
I want you to know, when the air conditioner's broken, my wife is not happy. She, you know, and I love her to death, but she's got a real short window of, of temperature happiness, you know? And uh, so I know that the most important thing about a car, not whether how it drives or how big the engine is, what the sound system's like or whatever, is that how good does the air conditioner work? So, you know, those things happen. Now, I was thankful it was just a loose wire. I was able to get in there and find out that a thermostat wire came loose and hooked, hooked it back up. But, you know, I want you to know that things that will steal your joy will come and go. You know, I was thinking about this message, and I was thinking about not too long ago, I was, uh, I was heading out the door. I was at an appointment, and uh, I, I have this tendency that I have, I drink three cups of coffee in the morning. I, I would say I'm almost addicted, but I'm not, okay? But I, I could probably make it without coffee after a few days and headaches, but uh, so whatever you want to call that. But, uh, I, I, but I, I, I began to think about making a list of everything that's trying to rob me of our joy. You know, whether traffic or interruptions or someone complaining or, you know, uh, think about those things. So I, I poured my coffee, a third cup, and went out into my truck, and I got up in the seat, and I was doing well. I was driving down the road, you know, and, and all of a sudden, for some reason, I bumped the steering wheel, and my coffee sloshed all over my pants and all over the truck seat, you know, and I looked around, and I couldn't find a Kleenex, couldn't find a rag, I couldn't find anything to wipe it up. So when I got to my appointment, I had these splotches all down my, and they were kind of a, a cream-colored pants. And I said, well, I'm, I'm just kind of, uh, I've got this new cow thing going on here today, you know. But, but I remembered the message, and I remember saying, I'm not going to let anything here destroy my joy. You see, it's so easy. In the daily life, in those interruptions, in those little things that we go, you know, to destroy our joy. I could have let that bother me. I remember one time years ago in my life, I would have let that bother me. It would have ruined my day. But you let them. The daily stresses of your life, the daily problems that you face will rob you of your joy. You know what? It is not worth it. It is not worth it. Now, I could spend all morning listing all the joy breakers, and I th but I think you get the idea. You need to be on lookout for anything that threatens to get between you and your ability to enjoy the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. And that's why the Apostle Paul reminded us and said, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. And that's why he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I don't know about you, but that's a tough, tough scripture. There are circumstances that we're going through. You know, cancer, hospitalizations, surgeries, heartbreaks, you know, job losses. We can go on down the list of all the negative things that happen to us. But he says, be joyful. Give thanks in all circumstances. In addition to eliminate the joy killers, focus on the joy builders. Focus on the joy builders. There are things that you can do each day to build on or to maximize, you might say, the joy that the Holy Spirit wants to bring in your life. So in Piper's definition of joy, he said that the Holy Spirit causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. Now, I like the way he phrased it. There are beautiful things in this life that if we will give them proper attention, they will increase our joy. Now, when I was younger, I had to take a lot of notice of things around me. I was so busy trying to accomplish what I need to accomplish. But now as I got older, I look up and thank God for the sunrises and the sunsets and the birds that are chirping, even if they annoy me for a little while. <laughs> I look at, you know, a lot of things that we take for granted that God has given us in creation. I mean, I, I enjoy just walking out, you know, and looking at a rocket launch. We see them almost weekly now. It's pretty cool to live in this area that we live in, to see what, you know, mankind can do to send up the rockets in the air. But, you know, look at the things that can increase your joy. Like spending time with people that you love the most your spouse, 
you know, your, your children, your family, your friends. And I'm not talking about spending time passively. I'm talking about spending time intentionally focused on what that person means to you and what this relationship means to you. Let me ask you something. Do you build up your relationship on a daily basis with your spouse, with your children? Do you tell them that you love them? Do you mean it? Do you spend time asking them about their day and really want to hear it? You know, I, men are the worst communicators in all the world when it comes to relationships. Because, you know, I want you to know something. It's the way we're built, the way we're wired, and it's not a slam on anything. But, ladies, you use a whole lot more words to describe your situation. Because while you're using those words, you're processing. You're processing. Now, you come home and you ask your husband, well, how was your day? You know what he says? Fine. You want more than that, right? You know, you so spend time using your words. Spend time talking with one another, asking about what's making each other tick. And then the other thing could include listening to uplifting music. I love listening to your band. It was they, I, I just love listening and singing along with beauty. And, you know, and why they're so good? Because they work at it. They practice. They get here early on Saturday. They get here early on Sunday morning. And they practice, and they do the very best they can do. And that's all God asks of us. And even someone may come in early or not, they don't do that. But I'm just saying, even if they did, you know, God still blesses it. Why? Because we give our best to the Lord. So listen to uplifting music. And I, I tune my radio into 88.3 a lot of times, and sometimes I'll turn it on into WCIF 106. And, uh, and, and that encourages me. And I'm not saying you're bad and going to hell in the handbasket if you listen to Country Western or something like that. Huh? But I'm just saying, hey, every once in a while, Put that station over to some uplifting music to keep you fueled up. Don't just wait for Sunday to happen. And this, I remember a story in 1 Samuel 16 about King Saul. Now, you remember King Saul? He had his share of problems. He had a lot of problems as a king. He was troubled sometimes by an evil spirit. And so what he would do when he was troubled, he would call for a teenage musician named David, who would later come, you know, and play his harp. The Bible said that David's music would make Saul feel better. See, that's the power of music. And when you take time to appreciate its beauty, God can use it to bring joy in your life. And another, time, another item on the joy building list is spending time in fellowship with God. Spending some time alone in the presence of God in prayer. It's like being in the presence of a friend. And these are just three examples of building joy if we were to ask you to build a list of everything that would build joy in your life the list would be very very long so each of us needs to learn to recognize and you know the joy builders that god has placed in our lives and give them our time and attention paul said in philippians 4 8 i love these let's just read this together whatever is true whatever is noble so read it out loud with me whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely what is ever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So you want a list to think about? There they are. You want to build joy in your life? Think about those things, pure things, lovely things, admirable things, excellent things, true things, praiseworthy things. That builds joy. So when we acknowledge and the more that we acknowledge the beauty of Christ and the word in the world, the more we experience the, the joy of the Holy Spirit that flows in us and out of us through the power of God. And it's a nice thing to know that the Holy Spirit becomes part of our life the very moment that we ask Christ to come into our life. And one more aspect of joy I want to mention briefly. While we eliminate the joy killers and we focus on the joy builders, we strive to bring, be a joy bringer. A joy bringer. A few minutes ago, I was talking about the things that kill our joy. And, I'm, you know, and uh, many of you know people that can, can drain the joy right out of a room. I mean, they can walk in, and there could be a happy room, and all of a sudden, next you know, everybody's, like, sad. You know, and uh, they're the people that you've got to be careful of, that you hang out with. Make sure that you have your, your joy tank really, really full. Because if you don't have it full, they'll, they'll make you into a negative person as well. And so let's all agree not to be the person that walks into the room and drains the joy out of it. You know, I had a deacon years ago, everything, everything I would, uh, very first church I pastored, 
He, in everything I would do, he'd say, well, pastors, is, I hate to throw, throw cold water on it. He always had a negative thing to say. He's always wanted to throw cold water on anything positive about trying to, to accomplish something for the kingdom of God because he didn't think it would work. You know, I was one of these people, I would try something, and even if it failed, at least I was trying something. You know, and a lot of things, they did work. A lot of times they failed. But at least I was trying to move on and see the kingdom of God increase and see people come to Jesus. And that's what every church needs to do. You'll try things out there, and Pastor Eric will lead you to do things, and you'll go, well, I don't know if that's going to work, you know. And you know what? Sometimes they won't, but a lot of times they will because he's praying for the Holy Spirit to give him guidance and leadership. So today's text, Paul has a couple of church members. And believe it or not, they were trying to settle. He wanted them to settle their differences. And he wanted them to agree with one another. Their names were Euodia and Syntyche. No wonder they were kind of negative people. They had names like that. <laughs> and so, can you write, hey, Euodia. Okay. Okay. And never mind. But uh, he's like saying the people of Philippi, you know, yeah, he, he wanted them to be aware of how your attitudes and actions affect others. You know, so we have to be careful of that. One of the ways that you can be a joy bringer is to leave the griping and complaining and bickering with others behind. And one piece of advice I read not too long ago said that we should strive each day to be a day maker. You ever, you ever had someone say to you, you've made my day. Well, Instead of others making your day, how about you making someone's day? It could be like giving them a, a, your server at the restaurant a little bit more tip and blessing them. It could be complimenting someone, say, that's a beautiful dress or whatever. You could say, thank you for, you know, uh, what you've done for the Lord. You know, be a, be a joy maker. Be a day maker. You know, give a gift to someone to show your appreciation. As I said last night, maybe... It's taking something that's kind of strange to most of us today is a, a note card and writing out with real words with a real pen and using a stamp. I know you have to save up for 60 cents to send it these days. But, you know, send it to someone. They get it in the mail. You know what? They really love it. I, as a pastor, I used to send birthday cards to my congregation. And, and, and let me tell you something. It took several hours every month as our congregation grew to send birthday cards to everyone. That was handwritten. But I want you to know something. I had parents would say to me, you know, Pastor Ralph, my little girl got her birthday card and she carried it all around the house all day long. See, be a day maker. You made her day. Make someone's day. Listen, the book of Proverbs says, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So when you give joy, it'll come back to you. It'll come back to you. So it feels good to help others. How many of y'all went to vacation Bible school? We're running out of time here, but how many of you ever went to vacation Bible school? Let me see your hands. Raise up. Okay. About half of you. And one of the things I learned when vacation Bible school was an acrostic, J-O-U. J-O-Y, excuse me, I can't, can't hear it. J-O-Y. Jesus, others, you. And if we use that, and understand that Jesus comes first in our life, others come second, and then we put ourselves in third place. We'll be able to be the joy maker, the day maker that God wants us to be. So I want you to think about all the things that take away your joy. Get rid of them. I want you to think about all the things that bring you joy and add them to your life and add them to the life of others. Serving others and then putting yourself last. And know that the power of the Holy Spirit in your life produces is a product of that fruit of the Spirit. And I pray that you'll have that joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And that only comes from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I pray that if you don't have Christ as your Savior today, you're not certain that you have him as your Lord and Savior, that today, if you'll say, yes, Jesus, I believe that you love me, that you died on the cross for me and my sins, and I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to come into my life. Will you do that today? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be a daymaker. I thank you for the joy that you give us through Jesus Christ. And I pray that, Lord, that you would use this time to glorify you. And, Lord, if anyone needs to 
Lord, to turn from sins in their life, that they would do so. Anyone that needs to turn from complaining and bitterness, they would get rid of it. Anyone that needs to be forgiven and needs to forgive others, they do so. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.